Yo, 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 what's up, what's up? It's Coach Nick, and I'm here with my lovely co-host, Deborah Face, your face for real estate. And today we're going to have another great episode of Real Deal Property Sharks, and you're with us. We're going to take a trip to Hollywood. That's right, Hollywood, but not California, Hollywood, Florida. That's right, people. And we're going to show you some amazing stuff in Hollywood, Florida. We're going to talk about... Joseph Young, the founder of Hollywood, Florida, and the amazing things to do in Hollywood, Florida, the restaurants, the beach, the boardwalk, rollerblading down the boardwalk, and my favorite, playing handball on the amazing handball court that's smack center on the beach in Hollywood, Florida. So buckle up and get ready for the ride, because you're with us, peeps. Here we go. Hollywood, Florida has a very rich history, including the life of Joseph Wesley Young. He was a real estate developer in Long Beach, California. He moved in the 1920s to what later became Hollywood, Florida. His vision was to create another Hollywood movie, Mecca. He spent millions of dollars in real estate development projects in an effort to create another Hollywood on the east coast of Florida. In fact, Deborah, he actually became so influential in the area that eventually became known as Hollywood, Florida, that he was elected as the first mayor of Hollywood, Florida in 1925. Isn't that amazing? And here's a fun fact about Mayor Young. He purchased a property on the main drag in Hollywood, Florida, which is called Hollywood Boulevard. The property is located at 1055 Hollywood Boulevard, and it is still in existence now. It's a beautiful mansion. Okay, he passed away many, many years ago, but the current owner is selling the property and supposedly Joseph Wesley Young's ghost is haunting the house. How about that, Deborah Face? Isn't that pretty wild? <laughs> Unfortunately, Hollywood, Florida never became the movie mecca that Joseph Wesley Young had envisioned when he first moved out from Long Beach, California to Hollywood, Florida. What ultimately ended up happening was there was the great hurricane of the 1920s that caused disruption and damage in the area of Hollywood, Florida, which set it back. And then, of course, at the end of the 1920s was the Great Depression. And then right after that, in the 1930s, was a series of other hurricanes that also damaged the area. And in 1934, Joseph Young passed away, and so did his dream of converting Hollywood Beach, Florida into the next Hollywood on the east coast of Florida. Pretty sad. Hollywood, Florida is absolutely gorgeous. It has beautiful canals, wonderful restaurants and shops on its main drags and on the beach boardwalk. The beach is to die for, wonderful restaurants, lots of recreational stuff to do, rollerblading, and an amazing handball court. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. But after the death of Joseph Young, the Hollywood Florida area went into a decline for many, many decades until it was revitalized in the beginning of the 2000s. The city of Hollywood spent millions of dollars in the early 2000s to revitalize the boardwalk and to really build up the infrastructure of the city of Hollywood to what it is today. 
Today it is absolutely breathtaking and one of the things that's absolutely amazing about it is that there's a lot of recreational stuff and as I mentioned before there is a state-of-the-art handball court in the center of Hollywood Beach that is absolutely fantastic. You know, Debbie, a lot of people call South Florida the sixth borough of New York City, and there's a good reason for it. There are so many transplanted people that have come from New York City and moved to South Florida. Quite honestly, it was so easy for me to adapt to this area because there's so many people from my hometown. And handball was one of the things that I grew up with in New York City when I was a little boy. So I was pleasantly surprised when I found out that Hollywood Beach had this wonderful handball court with people that actually would come every day of the week and play handball just like I used to do on Beach 17th Street in Far Rock. Queens. That's right, guys. I'm a Queens boy from Queens, New York, and they actually have a handball court down here with a bunch of people playing handball. And for our peeps who aren't familiar with what handball is, it's actually a game where you take a ball and you hit it against a wall. There's another form of handball called team handball, which is a Olympic sport, which is kind of like soccer, except you use your hands instead of your feet. But that's not the handball that I'm talking about. The handball that I'm talking about was the precursor to paddle ball, which was ultimately the precursor to racquetball. You take a ball, it's usually a blue, ball that you hit against the wall and you basically are trying to hit angles to make the other person miss. It used to originally be played with a really hard black ball, almost like the balls that you would see in paddle ball. Very painful. I don't know how people did it, but they would do that. Then people used to peel off the skin of tennis balls and play with the inside part of the tennis ball, which kind of looked like a pink version of the blue balls that they use now, which are the blue racket balls. Okay? Pretty wild stuff. In fact, Deborah, somebody must have been sipping some helium because someone actually came up with the idea of taking the pink ball that would be the core of the tennis ball and injecting it with helium so that when you hit the ball it would take really weird spins and cut and that ball was actually called a Spalding. So you actually have some people that actually used a Spalding ball that would bounce all over the place and they would sound like Mickey Mouse because they suck on helium. <laughs> now I'm kidding about that but that was the ball that was called the Spalding ball. But like I said, now most people use the blue ball that is used for racquetball. The game of handball has a very rich history. In fact, it was originally invented in ancient Roman times. That's right, the Romans actually invented a game of handball and it eventually made its way to outer cities of the Roman Empire in areas which eventually became France and Spain where they called it pelota which means I think in Spanish ball and if you say pelotas it means balls <laughs> The modern version of handball was actually developed in Ireland and in the 1800s the Irish immigrants that moved into Brooklyn, New York brought the game to the United States and handball to this day is a very well known game in New York. In fact, they have championship tournaments on West 4th Street in Manhattan to this day. Bill Casey, an Irish immigrant, built the first American handball court in Brooklyn in 1886. And in fact, he was such a good handball player that he challenged the champion handball players from Ireland to come across the pond to Brooklyn to play handball against them. The challenger was a 
gentleman by the name of James Lawler, who was the Irish champion, and Phil Casey actually played him in 1887 on August 4th. And Casey beat him. He won 11 games and retained the championship until his retirement in 1900. How about that then? So, Debbie, I guess you could say a little bit of Brooklyn still exists in Hollywood, Florida, because they have this fantastic handball court. And yes, you can find me there from time to time on the weekends. And Debbie, I'm going to get you to play handball, too. <laughs> yo, 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 what's up, what's up? It's Coach Nick, the lawyer. Check this out. We're at the handball courts in Brooklyn right now, and I just want to take a minute to talk to you about the accident cases. Yeah, I know. There's palm trees in the background. Just ignore it. They got them in Bushwick. Believe me. Check this out. You're injured, you're harmed because of a car accident, slip and fall, something like that. Give us a call. The law firm and Nick Cavallo is here to protect your rights. Peace, man. We love you. New York, New York. Hey, let's take a picture, 2 point up. Sure. Ready? There. One, two, three. Smile. I see you putting those bunny ears up there. Oh, sorry, oh. sorry, dude. Sorry, dude. Ah. Okay, folks, so that's another episode of Real Deal Property Sharks where we discussed the story of Joseph Young, the founder of Hollywood, Florida. Of course, we discussed beautiful Hollywood, Florida, and the history of handball because there's an amazing handball court in Hollywood, Florida. And we hope you enjoyed this episode. And this is Coach Nick for my co-host, Deborah Face your face for real estate and we are out of here we love you peace by peeps bye bye Yo, 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 what's up, what's up, it's Coach Nick, and this is another episode of Real Deal Property Sharks with the one and only my lovely co-host, Deborah Face, your face for real estate, and today we've got another amazing episode about Briny Breezes, Florida, and the history of mobile homes. Who says trailer parks are trash? Not when you see briny breezes, peeps. So buckle up your seatbelts and get ready for the ride. Here we go. So, okay, Deborah, in our research, we found out about a gentleman by the name of Frank Rowe. That's R-O-L-F-E. And he's actually the fifth largest mobile home person in the entire United States. And the man is a wealth of information about the history of mobile homes. And since we're doing this episode about Briny Breezes, which is the only mobile home community in South Florida that's on the Atlantic Ocean and has amazing views of the emerald and aqua waters of the Atlantic Ocean. Well, we needed some information about the history of the mobile homes. So we researched it and we found a man by the name of Frank Rolf and a lot of this information comes from him and we are going to share the really interesting story about how mobile homes came to be and how mobile parks were created and of course we're going to give you some beautiful views of briny breezes which is absolutely gorgeous. Are you ready Deborah? Because we're going to get started right now. Okay, so the history of mobile homes and trailer parks pretty much begins in the 1900s, the early 1900s, obviously because that's when the cars were first created. So right after the cars were created, 
people that had money were the people that were purchasing these automobiles and they would take them on road trips and they would have a blast. They'd go and take a look at beautiful lakes and oceans and mountains and all the beauty that exists in the United States. And then at night they would need to have a place to go and stay. And unfortunately, back then, everything was designed for train travel, so most of your hotels were near train stations, not near nature. And in addition to that, they were also, most of the hotels were also in cities, and a lot of times people would just go and check out the beautiful scenery that was off the beaten path. So, what you had was you had people with a lot of money who didn't have a place to sleep at night, and they'd end up pitching a tent and sleeping in a tent. Well, needless to say, that was wasn't the most attractive thing for people to do, especially if you had money. So they came up with the concept of having a mobile trailer, or as we'd like to call it, a mobile home that they could drive around with. How about that, that Deborah? Isn't that pretty amazing? In fact, peeps, these initial mobile homes were very posh. I mean, they were basically designed to be a home away from home, and only really wealthy people were able to have these type of homes. They oftentimes would even name the mobile homes like you would name a ship, right? Or a boat that you have, because it really was an extension of your existence, if you will. Uh, but here's what happened. In the 1920s, the late 1920s, the Great Depression hit and things started to change. So here's what happened. People were really struggling during the Great Depression of the late 1920s and early 30s. And that's when there was a major shift from mobile homes being used by the extremely wealthy as a place to stay while they were vacationing to mobile homes actually being considered a primary residence. So it was the depression that was a defining moment in changing the perception of the mobile home world. Pretty wild stuff. And check this out, in, 19, in the 1940s and 50s, after World War II, many of the GIs that came back from the war ended up living in mobile homes while they were studying at universities under the GI Bill to get their degrees and they were already accustomed to sleeping in mobile homes because when they were in the military in many instances they were living in mobile homes how about that brings back images of mash if you think about that show in the in the 19 i don't know what it was 1980s mash with uh alan alda and all that other stuff for you young peeps you may not know but you can go ahead and check it out probably on amazon prime there you go <laughs> And here's a couple of fun facts for you, Deborah. Did you know that in the 1950s, people that lived in trailer park communities actually had a greater financial backing than people that lived in single family regular homes? That's right, in the 1950s, you made more money if you were a resident of a trailer park than if you lived in a regular single family home. Pretty wild, huh? And how about this? One of the cutting edges, and this is another fun fact, one of the most cutting edges of trailer parks was a 1954 Spartan, which was actually created by J. Paul Getty. That's right, J. Paul Getty, the oil tycoon, Getty Oil. Come on, you guys know what that's all about, right? And he was one of the major manufacturers of mobile homes and the iconic 1954 Spartan mobile home was probably one of the spearing off points of mobile home all over the place. And then I got one more for you, Deborah. How about Elvis Presley made several movies during the 50s and 60s where he actually lived in mobile homes. He actually made two movies about that. Isn't that amazing? unbelievable stuff so everybody thinks that mobile homes are uh, not such a big deal but they're actually a pretty big deal huh and here's a couple of more fun facts for you peeps did you know that the mobile home industry is such a large industry in the united states that the housing and urban development department of the u.s government that's right hud hud is actually involved in the regulation of mobile homes how about that and if that doesn't get your interest how about this you know warren buffett you know that guy the guy that owns geico and he owns I don't know, Coca-Cola and all these other companies. That guy, that guy, Berkshire Hathaway guy. Well, that guy is one of the major players in developing mobile homes in the United States. So there you go. And that guy is one of the richest people in the entire United States. There you have it, peeps.
So here's something interesting, Deborah. Did you know that initially mobile homes and recreational vehicles, for you peeps that know the term, RVs, they were considered one and the same thing. There was no distinction between the two. The actual splitting of the mobile home industry and the RV industry happened once governments allowed for trailers that were wider than eight feet wide to be placed on highways and eventually the much more wider units became the more stationary mobile homes even though in fact they were mobile and the RVs which were not as wide became the recreational vehicles that people would be taking on trips and everything came full circle where the RVs became more of what the mobile homes were when they first started and the mobile homes became more like actual residences. How about that? Today, the mobile home industry is actually split between lifestyle choices, which is kind of like a competitor to single family homes, and mobile home parks, which are more like affordable housing or apartment living. So that's the distinction that exists now with the mobile home industry. And here's another fun fact. In mobile homes, they also have another split between senior homes and family homes, which means that in certain communities that are deemed senior mobile home parks, you have to be over 55 years of age to be able to live there. And with the other type of mobile homes, there is no age distinction. You, anybody could basically live there. So that's some of the fun and interesting information and history of mobile homes that we learned from our friend Frank Rolf. And what can I say? A wealth of information. Thank you, Frank. We really appreciate it. And comment below, peeps, if you want us to do a documentary biography on Frank Rolf. He is an extremely interesting person, and I think you guys might enjoy it. So we're looking forward to checking out your comments and seeing what you have to say. And now we're going to talk about Briny Breezes and its history, and this community is off the charts these sites that are there are absolutely gorgeous. So here we go, people. Not only is Briny Breezes a beautiful location overlooking the gorgeous Atlantic Ocean, but it also has unbelievable history to it. The trailer park community of Briny Breezes is located west of Boynton Beach, south of Ocean Ridge, and north of Gulf Stream on the beautiful Atlantic Ocean coast. In 1919, Ward Beecher Miller left Michigan and bought 43 acres of land that would be later known as Briny Breezes. It was originally known as Shore Acres and Miller used it as a turkey farm and a dairy farm. During the real estate boom of the 1920s, Miller sold parts of his land for $2 million. But after the Great Depression of 1929, Everyone defaulted and Miller had to take his land back. During the Great Depression of the 1930s, Miller had to come up with a way to make ends meet. So Miller came up with the idea to rent out his land to tourists who needed a place to park their trailers. Here's a fun fact, Nick. In the winter months, Miller would advertise in the no northern newspapers to rent his space out for $3 a week. Wow, what a bargain. You know, Deborah, by 1937, he had over 40 trailers parked on his land. In fact, it became a trailer park community that actually separated itself from the nearby town of Boynton Beach. Isn't that something? And in 1958, the residents of the trailer park community pulled their money together and bought Miller out. They each spent $2,000 to $2,500 per lot to buy Miller out and created the incorporated town of Briny Breezes. And here's a couple of fun facts, peeps. In 2005, the residents of the trailer park community in Briny Breezes were offered $500 million by a real estate developer to sell their beautiful oceanfront property. Unfortunately, even though the residents of the community wanted to sell, the deal ended up falling apart for technical reasons. What a shame, let me tell you. 
And you know, peeps, Deborah and I love giving you fun facts when we do these videos because, hey, why not have some fun with it, right? So here's some more really cool information about briny breezes. I guess that means salty air or something like that. Isn't that what briny is? I don't know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> here's the fun fact for you. Briny Breezes is the only oceanfront mobile home community in the entire state of Florida. And let me tell you something, there are a lot of mobile home communities in Florida. And also, Briny Breezes is one of two mobile home communities that are actually incorporated towns. The other one is called Ocean Breeze Park in Martin County, just north of Stewart, Florida. That's right, peeps. Okay, folks, so that's another episode of Real Deal Property Sharks, where we talked about the history of mobile homes and trailer park communities, and of course, the beautiful community of briny breezes right here on the southeast coast of the Atlantic Ocean in beautiful Florida. And this is Coach Nick and my lovely co host. The one and only Deborah Face, your face for real estate. And we are out of here, peeps. We love you. Peace. We'll speak to you soon. <laughs>